the talk can start. And yes, um, it's about metadata or against metadata. I think um, everybody knows about metadata by now. So I think I don't have to tell you very much about the talk. And the speaking is uh, Robert Oxhorn. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you. Thanks. This is what a digital video looks like without metadata. You are seeing and hearing a stream of raw digital bytes. Unlike a frame of film, which is two-dimensional, no shape inheres within computer memory. When we save data to disk, we must store metadata that allows for its familiar representation. In this case, the width and height of the video are unknown. And what you are looking at is a user interface I have developed um, for rediscovering the width and the height of a video. If I move the mouse to the upper left-hand corner of the screen, the video plays as if it's two by two. We can set the width and the height. We'll come back to this in a moment. If we consider um, that to be, that which I call signal, an example of data without metadata, then what I want to show you next, noise, is even a lack of data. The objective here is to cancel out noise. I can move the mouse to position a layer of anti-noise, which is identical to noise but I have no hints as to where they will meet. If I zoom in, a little more hope. Um, let's see. Is there sound, by the way? Or is that something that stopped? Um, here I start to see the patterns emerging as the anti-noise meets noise. And then there's nothing. There's nothing that can be found in noise. The only pattern is itself. You might have noticed some visual similarity at first between noise and signal. Without metadata, it can be hard to tell the two apart. I'm going to come back to this for a second and try to decode it. This is sometimes a little difficult. I'm moving the mouse around to set the width and height. The video that I'm trying to decode was released by WikiLeaks under the name Collateral Murder. I developed this interface between 2010 and 2011 in conversation with my friend Daph, inspired by a remark Julian Assange made um, that his organization had decrypted the video prior to its release. We wanted to give others the opportunity to decrypt the video to actively take part 
in overcoming the formidable hurdles we face to bear witness. From what I can tell, the technical reality of Assange's claim is controversial. From the, test, the tri um, trial of Chelsea Manning, there's some indication that the soldier had access to an unencrypted version of this video. Still, I think there's something to what Assange says, said, because even if his organization didn't perform magic crypto wizardry to bring the video to our attention, if he wasn't using this interface or anything remotely like it, he, he did decrypt it in a way, because the release of the video, um, starting with its title, Collateral Murder, was not merely a release of raw material, but also metadata. The video was not decrypted to find its machine-readable metadata, the crypto protocol, private key, audio video codec, width, height, and frame rate, but it was decrypted to make human-readable claims about the video. I think I'm about to give up on trying to solve it. The title of this talk is Against Metadata, submitted in the early midst of Dragnet surveillance disclosures. But perhaps after a more sober consideration, it should have been be called Beyond Metadata, or Towards a New Metadata, or some such. The summer of Snowden, as apparently it here is known, evoked in me a sort of double sadness, that all this metadata had leaked, and perversely, that the Dragnet ran so shallow. Metadata is too banal and, frankly, necessary to antagonize. But a plea, stop designing software that assumes the prior existence of metadata. I would like to split metadata into three categories. First, there is machine metadata, designed for the computer to interpret out of our sight, such as the width and height of a video stream, its frame rate, codecs, etc. Then we have metadatabases full of relational columns that more so than the original, are suited to rigid database systems and which are then used to stand in place of the original data, such as a book cover, titles and names of all sorts, icons, timestamps, GPS coordinates, and so on. Finally, the last sort of metadata I wish to consider is interpretive metadata, which is a layer of data describing what we make of the data. Compression is the basis and enabling force of networked media. And as with all machine metadata, it is deemed successful when it is invisible. This is an image which is represented digitally as an array of pixel intensity values. I can mix wires and turn up the volume so you can hear these values played back. Compression inherently involves a determination of what information is most important and a purge of the rest. For example, compressed images tend to assume a basic continuity, that pixels are similar to their neighbors, and therefore operate on spatial frequencies of pixels. So while we perceive this image as a 2D grid, the computer processes it a little bit more like this. And I can take these frequencies and one at a time start removing them, which you can hear. I'm removing the, pixel, the frequencies that are least salient. And I can flip back to the image, and we see that it's more or less unchanged. This is with 50% of the frequencies removed, which you may be able to hear. I can keep going. About 75%. 90. And finally, all of the frequencies are removed. I can add them back one at a time. And we can see the image start to become recognizable again. 
What would image compression look like if it was, were oriented towards humans and not machines? These are a series of portraits. And I've, um, I've given myself a parameter over each image, so I may compress it by horribly abusing the math uh, from seam carving uh, popularized by a paper on content-aware image resizing that was designed to um, invisibly change the aspect ratio of images for different sizes of displays. I hope that by dialing up all of these images at once, I can get a few laughs out of the audience. I see the ideal of metadata as encompassing the meaning of that data, and compression as a proposal for that meaning. If you laughed at these images, perhaps it is because you got more than you expected for them, that as a caricature, the compression functioned as an exaggeration of distinctive characteristics. In 1950, the pioneer of information theory, Claude Shannon, wrote, the meaning of a message is generally irrelevant. When I read that, at first I took issue with it. Shannon defines entropy, or information, relative to the average or expected message. Information is surprise, Shannon writes, and the encoding of a normal baseline into the superstructure of file formats and media codecs seemed a reactionary bias towards mediocrity from telegram to T9 codes. A machine may not be able to comprehend meaning, but it can be programmed to let some pass through a slip. And this is another side to Shannon's statement that perhaps I missed the first time around. Meaning need not be encapsulated within a packet for it to be carried through the medium. For temporal media, sound and video, codecs have given us greater and greater instantaneous fidelity, but leave us with few techniques to skim, seek, and survey. The timeline is a fixture of digital nonlinear editors, but rarely in our players is it much more than a line. This is 60 seconds of video represented with 12 thumbnails, each spaced five seconds apart. This is the same 60 seconds, but now with 24 thumbnails, two and a half seconds apart. Left half, right half. And when I keep cropping the images more and more down to a single pixel, all of a sudden a form reemerges within the image. People in cars are visible again. Movement is frozen through the column of pixels I choose, I, I take in, no matter which column that is. I can look at the next 60 seconds and see a similar effect, or the next 60 seconds. Now we see a parabola. And when I uncrop the images, we see a series of them. I'm interested in a point about here, where you see the form, you see the icon, the clock, the buildings. But you also see how they relate to time and how they change, the part and the whole. The timeline can function as a graphic metadata to communicate the contents of video without, in fact, having any idea of them. Here is the timeline's index, 15 films by cut at different phase. And I can play the video through these timelines. using them as index. <laughs> These timelines eventually turned into a web-based documentary I did in collaboration with the filmmaker A.L. Sivan. 
here we have an, um, metadata as the film. Tags serve as entry points to the material. Poursuivi maintenant par les Français et démasqué par les Arabes, j'étais doublement foutu. Je pense à une histoire arabe. C'est un type qui décroche le téléphone et qui dit allô. On lui répond non, c'est Ali. Again, we have these slit scans. Si j'avais crié, il m'aurait de nouveau assuré. And the tags allow us to pivot to change how we're seeing something without it stopping. <laughs> Metadata as authorship is only the beginning. For if this is the real-time generation, real must be intended as in reality TV. The rise of portable MP3 players gave us the opportunity for our lives to have soundtracks. And the smartphone, NSA, spy glasses, etc., all give a thickening metadata layer to lived experience. We are making history as we are living it which I mean less in a congratulatory reference to our significance, but simply pointing to the accumulation of documents and datas that we, or someone, something, must sort through. Here I am live coding a video editor to organize screencasts of myself live coding a video editor. It is the classic Borhean problem of the map and the territory. For every attempt at curation, is also recorded and re-ingested. Borges wrote about the empire's fanatical attempt to create a map so detailed it ended up as large as the space it sought to describe, the map occluding and suffocating the territory. But that was before the advent of slippy maps, before level of detail distillations. We have the present moment, and while a map of the future is hard to come by, we can control our view of the past with a fluid zoom control. Try to work your head around the passage of time here. We have a video metadata that traps us neither in the present or the past. Applied back to the first timelines I showed you, those from John Smith's brilliant 1976 short film, The Girl Chewing Gum, itself a biting critique of cinematic authority, we have an experimental film I made called Chewing. Notice how time passes and also how it doesn't. How characters are endlessly looped into themselves. So we can design video codecs that give rather than remove context. All of the math of codecs is valuable. And I hope that some of you who indubitably understand it better than myself will work on opening up codecs to our perception. To show you what I mean in a different way, Consider the math of a video stabilizer. Put simply, a stabilizer deforms each frame to the previous. And when engineers design stabilizers, they zoom in to hide the edges that are irregular. But what if instead of zooming in, we, can, we zoom out? Now we have a context, 
we have what is no longer seen. I call this technique periphery in admiration of our perceptual system, which gives us so much out of sight context. I hope I've suggested a few ways that machine metadata can be designed to reveal rather than obscure, and how the inevitable metadatabases we form can empower our curation and comprehension rather than functioning as advertising and entertainment. The most practical software that I've been designing for this is called Interlace. I have very limited time, but I'll show you very quickly um, a little screenshot, a little screen of a project I did in collaboration with a conference, suitably enough for my meta tastes, about video. There's uh, the entire conference, which is visible through zoomed, zoomable timelines. Yeah. And then there's a series of footnotes that provide an alternate so mode of navigation. He talks about um, the hit by Tamar Shaban in his um, dorm room in Georgia while. There's a theory if you want to change the world that you have to do it by helping people share cat videos. I don't quite know about that, but I'll show you something a little bit less serious fed into this sort of machine. Let's see how it does. Um, yeah, maybe we should take questions as you look at the snorkeling video. I had some other things, but I have absolutely no time. Anyone? If there are no questions, we have five minutes. <laughs> this is called okay. Interlace. Yeah. Uh, um, and the software is, um, code is on readmes.num.org. There have been a, quite a few iterations by now. The latest is Interlace 4. Um, alpha grade. <laughs> Be patient. There's one question. Um, I guess I'm taking your challenge of curation Quite literally, I'm an archivist with a collection of archival films. And something like this, on the one hand, which provides an overview of the entire contents of a film, would be incredibly useful as a, a f tool, as a finding aid to our collections. But on the other hand, if it is video, there's uh, we have to design what we put out on the web as a finding aid for the absolute lowest common denominator of technology of users worldwide. Um, is there a tension there? And how would somebody like, how would record keepers like me um, sort of smooth over that tension? In terms of lowest common denominator, if you're looking at a web browser, um, I'm pushing the limits of the browser a little bit, but it's pure HTML5. It's all open source. There's no lock-in, and there's um, no barriers to free implementations that would provide access. Usability is still something I'm working on gotcha. on the other end. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm thinking more of bandwidth, because something that's sort of a static series of images takes up a lot less space, really, than, than sort of here is. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, having a visual index <laughs> lets you watch the part of the archive you're interested in. Downloading the entire file exactly. um, is more bandwidth. Um, I did a lot of optimization to try to make this like vaguely palatable over a network connection. Um, but I mean, these are tiny little videos. They're um, uh, just indices. It's like a search index, but for video. Um, Brilliant. I don't know if I've answered any of any questions. You've at least maybe maybe re ask the most important again. Yeah. Um, Actually, I can't remember what it is. I, I'm going to have to um, basically then, think about it. But then we have another question out. over there. If you have a question, can you go to the microphone? And microphone number one. Hi. Hi thanks. That was really great. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the pleasure of working with video as my uh, main mm. source of data day to day. And it's um, much more drier context of numbers and, uh, and text. Um, and I can see some um, 
similarities in, in what you've done with, uh, you know, spear cons and um, spindexes, or however you're supposed to pronounce it, with, with sonification and some visualization. But I wonder, have you, have you, ah, uh, yes, well, I was just going to ask you to, um, well, do that, yeah. <laughs> I had more I wanted to show. <laughs> um, but I've tried to apply the same paradigms to dumps of unsorted freedom of information law requests and to sound with spectrograms and provide ways of nonlinearly um, exploring all sorts of different kinds of data that doesn't have a clear archival canonical metadata available to it. If there's no other question, I think, shall. Say thank you again. <laughs>